hello, hello, everybody, one and all, welcome to another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, but not just any fantasy today. You know, it's a new year, it's a new month, and it is a new edition of the Who Would Win Fantasy Matchup Generator Series. Oh, welcome to 2021, everyone. <laughs> this is it, people. This is our, like, I don't know at this point, fourth installment, third installment of this uh, of the series. Our algorithm is learning. Every time we do this, <laughs> it gets smarter and smarter. And the, mat- Does it? the, mat- <laughs> the matchups <laughs> get zanier and zanier. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about smarter, but the list gets bigger. You know, we got to add some the first law characters to the list, which we're very excited about. Yeah, I'm pumped to get the likes of Logan and uh, uh, we got Giselle Dan Luther, so Inquisitor Glockta in the mix. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> we've got we've got all the POV characters and a few more surprises sprinkled in from First Law. So hopefully the generator gods are on our side and sprinkle a few of those into today's recording session. And uh, shall we just not delay any longer? Shall we generate our first fantasy matchup? D- did we explain how the I, fantasy yeah, matchups work? That's true. So we created this um, generator of sorts that puts in characters from all over the world of fantasy, from series that we've read, series like King Killer Chronicles, Miss Born, First Law, Lord of the Rings, all of our old buddy reads, as well as a few pop culture uh, references thrown in there just for excitement, as well as a few of your favorite fantasy podcast hosts are sprinkled in there as well. So uh, you never know what's going to come up. We're also generating various contests because, you know, who would win in a fight is interesting, but, you know, it's not, you got to make it spicier. You could get fight. You could get, uh, you could get a cook off. You could get a uh, race, a foot race, drinking contest, chess, debate, trivia, you know, dueling with weapons, you know, fist fighting, the whole, the works, anything's possible. And the matchups that we get are, you know, we like to speculate on the age old question, who would win? This is speculative fiction <laughs> at its best. Yes. Yeah, speculating on speculative fiction. It's, you can't make this stuff up, folks. This is the real deal. Right. <laughs> So thank you for that eloquent summary of how Who Would Win works, Charles. I think now uh, you and I, as well as the listener, is ready for some of these matchups to get generated. I'll generate the scenarios and you generate the characters. Will do. Also worth noting that this will be spoiler free for all of these series. So if you don't know who a character is, it might be difficult to follow along with the speculations but just know that we're not going to spoil first law or spoil um right lord of the rings or anything like that you know keep spoiler free here so keep this up in your headphones right dylan <laughs> nailed it <laughs> all right <laughs> i am ready for our first generator are you sir i'm ready all right we're going beep boop Beep. We've got a fencing matchup, Charles, and I, I have to hope that we have good old <laughs> Giselle Dan Luther in the mix. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Our first character in the matchup, the, uh, a strong philosopher, uh, keep him away from that pewter because who knows how strong he can be. We're talking about Ham from Miss Bourne against... She's always two steps ahead. The head of Sweet Mercy. The mastermind herself, Abbas Glass. I mean... Right? You gotta give it to Ham. This is over. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I mean... This is a pretty short game situation. (laughs) And we know of Abbas Glass 
from the Book of the Ancestor that she's a long game player, not a short game player. Yes, and she's also I mean, at the beginning of the series, she's an old lady. And Ham is at the beginning of Mistborn, a strong pewter burner. And while Abbas right. Glass is very powerful in terms of her mastery of serenity, which is like this meditative state that these nuns at Sweet Mercy Convent get into, she's never demonstrated any particular feats of agility or strength like a lot of other nuns have, have demonstrated. She's definitely more of a like uh, higher level, like executive structure, ma- mastermind planner right. than she is. Strategist. Yeah, than she is on the f- if a front line chess soldier. Yeah. Or Catan or something of that nature. Then yeah. <laughs> anything yeah, not physical, trouble, anything but... meant, although if it was like a debate, that could be tough because Ham is a bit of a uh, <laughs> a thinker. <laughs> Yeah, I'd still go Abyss Glass yeah. but in that case. But Charles, you're right here. In a physical contest like fencing, Ham wouldn't even need to get the pewter out to mm-hmm. beat Abyss Glass. I think you got to go Ham. You I mean, any Ham. other character from Book of the Ancestor <laughs> that's in our generator probably would have had a shot yeah. to make this interesting. But nah, it's Ham. Yeah, like I'd give it to Nona for sure. But uh not Abbas Glass. Although I do think Abbas Glass and Ham would get along, you know. I think right. Ham would be very entertained talking to Abbas Glass. And I think Abbas Glass would be very accepting uh, of Ham. And they, they could get into some debates and Glass could teach Ham a little bit of philosophy. They could go back and forth. I think they'd have a good time, but they would not be fencing. No, I wouldn't imagine a scenario where this would actually happen but that's what the generator is for now it's, we know. it knows more than any of us <laughs> it... <laughs> that's right this is something we've never i don't think anyone on this planet has ever thought about before that we have thought about for the first <laughs> time here and you know what you can't get that on any other show so <laughs> take no that for what it podcast, is podcast <laughs> yeah no other podcast would waste your time <laughs> talking about whether Abbas Glass or Ham would win in a fencing contest, but luckily you've got us here to do it for you. Yeah, but you know, so, Abbas so- Glass was always a journey over the destination kind of human being, and I imagine Ham would be too, so it's just all about having Agreed. fun. Shall we get on to the next matchup here? What's our next contest? Let's do it. Next contest is beep, boop, beep. It's a duel with weapons, which is basically, <laughs> that doesn't feel very different. From, well, I think, I guess it's like duel with weapons is like you bring whatever your weapon of choice is while fencing is a sword in particular, right? Like right. a fencing sword. You fenced in high school, right, Charles? I took a few fencing classes in my day, you know, back in high school. It's different from just with weapons because if you're a weapons specialist in something less agile, more brute force, you might be able to right. win, you know. Fencing, there's, like, rules that, and, like, like a specific way of fighting that you have to do, whereas just fighting with weapons, anything goes. So uh, it's a bit okay. more open-ended. And um, this may be a little bit more of an, another mismatch here. You have um, found, discovered, frozen in a block of ice by two water tribe children and then revealed to be uh, the avatar, uh, Aang, the last airbender, and on the other side, why does he do this, you might ask? Well, <laughs> there's no one knows, but uh, you know who we're talking about. It is Inquisitor Glockta from the First Law trilogy. Right. Well, if you've read First Law, you know that by the time it's started up, Glockta has been a victim of really horrific torture at the hands of the Gurkish, leaving him without the capabilities to really have a shot against uh, a competent opponent like Aang. But h- how about this, Charles? We know that before Glockta went through uh, what he went through, he was he was the person who'd be probably best at the fencing competition. Uh, in so instead of Inquisitor Glockta, it's Commander Glockta. Colonel. Colonel, right. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Colonel. He was a commander. He was at one point. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be interesting. And then he would definitely win in fencing. <laughs> yeah. But what about a duel with. I feel like Ang. Th- Do you I'm... count his, like, glider as a weapon? Yeah. Yeah. So 
Yeah. He's a pretty competent fighter, and he has supernatural abilities. Yeah. Which... It's going to be a tough one. And he is the Avatar. The... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess it's probably still Aang, right? Like, right. He's, he's able to use a supernatural And this is, again, if this abilities. was a duel of wits, we'd be having a different conversation. But because... Whoa, Charles. <laughs> what? You're always anti-Aang when it comes to the wits here. <laughs> Aang is not educated. <laughs> <laughs> A- Aang was frozen in a block of ice for a hundred years. Glock does um, a mastermind. Well, he's politically savvy at least, uh, and um, he definitely is has this investigative mind and yeah. is able to uh, think about things in a problem solving way that would put him pretty far in many duels of wit. It's basically the last thing he has. You know, at the beginning of this thing, he's his mind is basically his his biggest strength and how he manages to survive mind is his weapon that's right mind is his weapon but unfortunately it doesn't get you far when your opponent's the avatar <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough one yeah duel with weapons uh glockta you're gonna need more than your mind in this one yeah and i think we gotta give it to Aang. gotta give it to Aang. shall we generate another contest hopefully one that's not involving uh, uh fighting with weapons of any kind all right. Well, this will probably not involve any fighting because it's a cook off. Ooh, cook off. All right. So let's pick again some characters here. All right. We've got two names here. Uh, in one kitchen, we have another mastermind. You may have found him nose in a book over at Synagard, and that is Kite. On the other yeah, side, and from the Poppy War trilogy. That's right, the Poppy War Trilogy. And then on the other side, you might find him uh, teaching a class, but he typically doesn't show up. And that is Elodin. Master Namer from the King Killer Chronicle. That's right. So, yeah. I mean, the first thing we usually think here, Charles, is there anything canon-wise for us to go on for what we'd be thinking when it comes to a cook-off. Right. And I feel like Kite, I feel like there are times where Kite cooks. I, I can't name one off the top of my head, but I feel like he's he's probably done it at some point. Um, I do know that in King Killer, there's a canon moment where Elodin, uh, where Elodin Ari, and Quoth cook up like a fish and eat a meal. Uh, but I don't. I think Elodin just kind of stumbled into that meal and partook in it. Maybe I don't think he cooked anything. Um, Kite, did he cook? I, for most of the series, I feel like you know they're on the war path and they're kind of eating military rations. So it's hard to see them enjoying food. But Kite did grow up in a noble family, and one of the first right. things that Rin commented on when visiting Kite's home during peacetime at the beginning of the series was the delicious food. So we exactly. know Kite has eaten delicious food. And does that transfer? But can he cook it? That's the, that's the age-old question, Dylan. That's what we're here to puzzle <laughs> out today. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's take a step back, though. Okay. Elden may or may not know, like, literally, we, this isn't be like dancing around spoiler <laughs> it's like we don't know a ton about Elden. what we do know is he is good at naming he's a master namer right yes so i think when you understand the essence of things at that level this is a guy who could probably analyze the ingredients of things and know their worth so well i don't know i think this guy could break it down and cook up just about whatever he mm. needed to. I like where you're going, but I wonder, can you name, like, a steak? <laughs> can you, like, just, like, I name you steak, and then, like, this beautiful, the, st- the steak just cooks a beautiful medium rare, you know? Is that a thing? Because usually it's, like, Maybe things like stone. name the pot. Oh, like you name a, <laughs> that's true. Right, Get control. a nice even sear, yeah. Yeah. He could name, like, plants or something, make a nice salad. <laughs> right more organic things yeah you know i think when you have to you know we don't shy away from making the tough decisions here at the french talking fantasy podcast and i think when it comes down to it without 
proper canon to support us here, I think we have to go with this idea that naming over just being a noble-born person has to give you an edge, right? Yeah. I think that's fair. I'm with you, Charles. All right, friends talking fantasy, throwing down the gauntlet here. We've got a winner, uh, and that is Elodin, the master namer. I'm not sure if it's going to be good, but it will might be better than Kate's in a cook-off, and that's all you got to do to win in this matchup. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm already generating our next matchup. All beep, right. Boop, beep, beep, boop, boop. beep. It's an election, Charles. Oh, now this is going to be interesting because in one corner, we have once was broken, has now been remade. I'm talking about the sword that belongs to Aragon, king of men. And then on the other side, that's going to be a tough one. It's going to be tough. But on the other side, you have um, a fellow noble born and childhood friend of our cook off loser, Kite. We have the son of the dragon warlord that is Neja. Hmm. They're both nobility. Yes. They're both trained and raised to be leaders, and now they're running in an election. Okay. So you have to think, Aragon's got the the story. I mean, I I guess we said no spoilers for anything, not even (laughs) Lord of the Rings, right? So uh, Lord of the Rings, you probably already spoiled technically spoiled uh, something, maybe. right? <laughs> if you haven't read any Lord of the Rings. Let's not dwell on it. <laughs> <laughs> what may or may not have been spoiled in Lord of the Rings is not the issue here. <laughs> but, uh, yes, that is true. Let's do our best to skate around spoilers, but Lord of the Rings, you know, one of those ones that has slipped into the... Com- we have- It's a little bit, yeah, Statue of Limitations type... Thing. Fair, but what we do know is that you know all these characters that are from Lord of the Rings, right, are very virtuistic, very good and or evil, and uh, you know Aragon kind of falls into this more, uh, you know, and he's one of the members of the Fellowship, so that speaks volumes as to like how good and noble and virtuistic he could potentially be and you know when you're in lord of the rings i mean come on that's tough like poppy war series is fantastic but it's it's a rookie player right it's first year in you know the the dragon republic just came out lord of the rings is like literature you mean burning god just came out Yeah, burning god just came out and um you know as much as i think neja is a great upstart and is born into nobility um, and would be a strong candidate in any election type contest. I- I'm leaning towards Aragon on this one. So Charles, is this like uh, an election in the U S is this an election <sighs> in middle earth? I, I think, I mean, I feel like in the past we've treated it as a presidential election in the U S. Yeah. I that- mean, I'm sure people write in Aragon's name already. Um, <laughs> Yeah, right that's true. <laughs> so i honestly think we could isn't there a website somewhere where you can see like how many votes all the different write-ins and stuff get yeah. i think i know that because our high school english teacher mr price made us promise to vote for him at some point in our lives like made price us was our social studies class. teacher <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> Price was our social studies teacher. Sorry. Yeah. I'm used to us talking about Mr. Miller. <laughs> it's Mr. <laughs> Borland. That. What's that? Mr. Borland is who we talk about. No, we talked about Miller at one point. Anyway, not <laughs> what people come to come to our podcast to listen to. So, yes, Mr. Price made us guarantee that we would vote for him at some point and said there was a website, I think. So we could probably check. I, I would bet Aragon probably got more votes than Neja in 2020's election. That's true. So, and I feel like Neja would be, wouldn't be would understand how democracy works. You know, warlords are like, there's the peasants and then there's us. And- you think Aragon would understand how democracy works? 
but what I'm what I'm trying to say is that Aragon like loves all people and is like a man of the people. Neja and his father, who is the warlord, are almost like um, you know they're military leaders. They're warlords, right? So they have a very unlikable way of being in power and we know that you know being a peasant is not great and that the nobility is um very biased and you know they're you know racism classism all very strong and Nezha at the beginning of this series is very much the embodiment of all of that stuff uh, uh, uh or at, at least you know that's how it's portrayed and then Aragon is the exact opposite Aragon is um he's like oh Hobbits are cool. Oh, these people are cool. Oh, these people. I'll help you. I'll help you. And I'll help you. You know, like, I feel like that kind of uh, mentality is going to get you far in an election when you have to have the people vote for you, you know? I don't think Neja can play the middle. Right. <laughs> well, all right. I'm with you, Charles. I I think Neja would be able to wrap his head around uh, democracy, but yeah. I think that's all that's all extraneous to the conversation, which is that... Aragon's popularity is gonna get him to win this one, I think. For not sure. even RF not even Rebecca Kwong likes Neja <laughs> based on the interviews that I <laughs> right. I mean just imagine right. they're in a debate and like mid sentence Aragon just like steps up on the podium and sings like a beautiful ballad. That's gonna win over the people. <laughs> Very Might Lord of the like, Ring style. I don't know. I think people would be a you think they'd be like, this bit. is boring, let's skip yeah. this part? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think they would do what I uh, may or may not have done at times, which is when Glaze I saw over a little giant bit. italics thing coming up, especially when it was in a language uh, that, a language that isn't real, <laughs> in Elvish. Like, what am I supposed to do here? And uh, yeah, you just skip over that, and you're like, well, this Neja guy is making a little more sense but all said and done it's it's aragon i mean i could not agree more it's aragon all right well shall we generate another one charles let's do it okay it's a rap battle charles okay so in one corner we have another membership of the fellowship Another human being, son of Darathor, it is the firstborn son, Boromir, against, you know him well, guys, a co-host in the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast. Turn it up in his headphones. It's Dylan. (laughs) Oh, wow. Me against Boromir. In a rap battle. Has Boromir, like a lot of characters sing in Lord of the Rings, but I don't know if Boromir ever did. It's a good question. Yeah. I mean, you know Lord of the Rings is a bit better than me, Charles. I'm going to go with you on this one. I want to say that he did not. Okay. I know he is the subject of many a song, but I do not think he ever stood up and sang anything, but I could be wrong. Well, tweet at us at the FTF but Podcast one Let's say no. Yeah, let's say no. Oh, man, this is a tough one, I guess. Uh, I mean, Lord of the Rings characters do know their verse, I'll say. Um, Dylan, uh, I've never heard you rap. (laughs) So (laughs) that's going to work against you. (laughs) Yeah, but I think the difference between me and Boromir is I've heard of rap. I've heard other people rap. uh, I've heard some quite good people rap. Or quite good rappers rap anyway, That's and true. Uh, I, I think I could better adapt to the situation of all of a sudden. Okay, you have to rap, Boromir. You're starting all the way back at like, well, okay, here's what rap is. It's kind <laughs> of like singing, but you just kind of say it. But there's a beat, and he's. I think he's still feeling out what rap is by the time we start. So though it's a very embarrassing display on both of our parts, I'm going to say we got to give this to me, Charles. (laughs) No surprise there that you're defending yourself. Uh, I'm just trying to get into uh, the mind of Boromir here. I I picture like um, 
eight mile style where it's like this underground yeah. scene there's a crowd there's a beat playing it's on the stage it's the mc and then it's you in one corner you're kind of bopping and boromir on the yeah, other it's he's like got a beat playing his, i'm like all right all right all right yeah he's got his up in my he's got a fellowship cloak on he's got <laughs> the sword in his thing yeah yeah and he's like uh my name is Boromir. I'm here to say you do that. I'm going to out wrap you in a major way. Dylan's rhymes are a bore. One does not simply walk to Mordor, you know, like that. <laughs> and he would just, and people <laughs> would be like, "It's too bad you're not in the contest." <laughs> I know. And, and then you'd be like, um, "Turn this up in my headphones, guys!" <laughs> and people would be like, "Boo." <laughs> well. I mean, I'm obviously not a good impartial judge here, <laughs> Charles. So uh, oh, if right. you insist, if you insist, we can give it to Boromir. Well, you do make a good case. I mean, one has to say, how much do we understand, do the characters have to understand about rap? Because none of these fantasy characters do. Um, and given Boromir as no poetic um, canon about him, he never sang a song. If Boromir had a song in the trilogy that I'm not remembering, I would give it to him, but uh, I'm happy to give it to you. You know, I'm fine with that. If you insist, Charles, I'll take it. We got to keep the winning record for the friends talking. I'm undefeated. Show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Let's generate another yeah. Dylan for the win. Catan win. Both. I also just beat you in Catan recently, Charles, in, in the real world. Yeah, that's so true. We know what happens if that matchup comes up. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up on the air. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, what's the next contest? Let's hear. It. Let's hear it. Um, beep boop, beep, beep boop beep. It's generating beep boop boop. We've got the the beautiful game. It's Tack from the King Killer Chronicle. Ah, Tack from the King Killer Chronicle. A board game that uh is all about well i guess there's strategy to it but we know a lot of a huge piece of it is like oh you can play to win and you can or you can play a beautiful game you know that's kind of the it's kind of a motif for the whole series honestly so yeah tack all right so it's like chess if the point was to just enjoy the beauty of play absolutely right and there's All a real right. board game. There's a real tack. I've seen Did that. Did you know that, Charles? I've yeah. seen that. I, I wonder how it trend like if you can just play a beautiful game. You know, I'd be curious to try that out. Yeah. Rothfuss was involved in the That's good. Not like heavily involved in the making of it, but was like playing it and, and like he endorsed it and so he endorsed it. Endor- yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. He's all in on it. Cool, cool. Yeah, then that's gotta be that's close to f- official as you can get. Yeah. All right. Well, in one corner. Uh, we have um, up in the union. Y- you might find him staring at the mirror, admiring his perfect <laughs> yes. chin. It's none other than <laughs> Jazal Dan Luther, and then from the Everyone's first law trilogy by Joe Abercrombie, yeah. everyone's favorite narcissist. That's right. In the <laughs> other corner, uh, you might find him in the swamps of Dagobah, master of the Force turned hermit turned. Jedi trainer, it is none other than Yoda. <laughs> okay, so here's where I'm thinking right off the bat. I think Yoda would understand the beautiful game idea way better than Giselle could grasp it. Right. I I think Giselle wouldn't really get what it means to just play something for the sake of uh, the art of it. And I think that two first timers to the tack board here that Giselle might take this one because what? Yoda would yeah Yoda would be caught up on the beautiful game no, aspect. No, yes. No. And Giselle would go for the win. Dude, your bias for Abercrombie characters is crazy right now. If I'm not mistaken, that whole beautiful game thing happens when a character like Jazal plays a character like Yoda. You've got this like um, young, uh, maybe narcissistic, but more like self-focused character playing against sure. a wiser, 
older guy who's like, son, <laughs> you think you're playing the right way, but there, I got wisdom here. And that wisdom tells me that there's more than just doing the thing that gives you the best chance of winning. There's this beautiful game aspect of it. And I, you know, Yoda sits perfectly in that role. Jazal is so self-absorbed. It, he's, he's never earned anything in his life. He's not <laughs> capable of, of winning a game against Yoda, who's hundreds of years old and who is so wise and um, who would probably be very good at a board game like this. I don't know. I, I have a hard time. Like, there's nothing about Giselle Giselle. is great at cards. Charles. Oh, that's true. You're not true. taking that into account. That's like one of Giselle's defining features is that he's a great card player. That's and he true. he smokes all of his friends at that. He's got a great read on his friends and their tells. So we know he's good but at strategy But does being strategy good games. at tells and... and poker make you a good tack player or just the opposite I think, no charles here's the thing i think tack the the moment you're talking about in tack from the king killer chronicle is a moment where the the more self-obsessed character let's say the more jazal type the more jazal type although that's not a great uh one-to-one -one there but the more jazal type of the uh, two involved kind of gets closer to winning than he should have, I guess. And then this more sage character has to remind him, look, this game isn't about winning. But who would win is all about winning, Charles. So I think that... It's yeah, but not who won like that match is what I'm saying. More... Yeah, he won the match because he's way more experienced <laughs> and he's... Like, that guy has played a lot of tack, and he was teaching the other person how to play. Yoda's never played tack. There's no reason to believe he's good at any strategy games. Uh, he probably would be more prone to playing worse and not winning, although he's playing more beautifully. And Giselle, there's canon reason to think he's good at these kind of, like, small strategy games. Give it to Giselle. Uh, for Tweet me, at us at the FDF Podcast 1 if you disagree. I Let's have, have a such a hard time giving it to Giselle, but I will always go to the canon and because there is canon of just all being good at cards which granted is not tack um i will concede this one and let you have Giselle. however i'm not convinced <laughs> 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 and i would like to see other people's thoughts here i just think when you have wisdom versus the selfish young up or not selfish but like you know can't see outside his own bubble of himself versus uh, a wiser person. I think that's the whole point of what makes Tack a beautiful game is that there is some artistry and wisdom in it. But, you know, but you got to give it to the canon. There's game canon for Chisal, so I'm happy to relent. <laughs> Feels good. But we will we'll never truly know. <laughs> Right, someone's gonna have to write fan fiction of this at some point. I mean, I think that yeah. would be a funny encounter. I think Giselle would have no patience or respect for Yoda at all. <laughs> yeah, the Giselle Yoda, <laughs> like he'd be like, uh, "Get away from me!" You, I would. He'd be like, "Oh, gross!" He'd be like, <laughs> he would think it's some kind of like, <laughs> he's like some kind of green gross animal, yeah, wrinkly. yeah. And he'd probably be like, uh, "Guy has." Uh, because he looks in another character's eyes, I won't say who, even though it's not really a spoiler. And he's like, "No more like brains going on back there than an animal." And yeah. I feel like he'd think that of Yoda too, just because Yoda's he probably a wouldn't muppet. even assume it was a sentient creature. Yes. He's probably <laughs> once he saw it in his peripherals, it would probably <laughs> scare him and be like, "Oh, gross! Someone like get that out of here! Someone throw that away!" <laughs> and then Yoda would be like, "Judge me by my size, you do." Hmm? <laughs> and he'd make him like he'd like turn him upside down with the force or something. God, the fan fiction of like Yoda in the place of Marshall Veru's training yeah. Giselle, right? I feel like that needs. To, like, come on, someone write that. I want to read <laughs> that. It. Would be funny because I feel like Yoda would be giving Giselle tips, and Giselle would be like, "What do you know? You <laughs> you don't know anything." <laughs> So, yeah. So yeah, that would be funny. Um, should we do one more before our finale? Yeah, let's do one more. All right. Beep boop beep boop beep. 
We've got a trivia contest. Trivia, eh? Very yeah. interesting. Okay. First up is um, All Ten. Everyone's favorite at the Academy of Synagogue. Uh, the next person that we have lined up for us today it comes to us from the King Killer Chronicles. Uh, you might know him as the school bully, perhaps, but I guess oh. it depends who you ask. And that character is Ambrose. Yeah. It's Ambrose versus Altan in a battle of trivia. I mean, off the bat, Alton plays a role in this in the Poppy War trilogy where when we're first introduced to him, if that's even the right way to phrase it, he's just like this person that everyone at the in Rin's class hears about how great he is at everything, including school, all the academic stuff. He's a great fighter, all these kind of things. And it almost becomes a joke among their little class there that it's like, oh, Alton would have done this in like this amount of time or whatever. Right? Right, Alton right. would have done better than that. So I think that given we have canon reason to think that Alton is probably very knowledgeable or good at school and stuff. My early thoughts are he's probably got the advantage over Ambrose, who's kind of like privileged, pampered, all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And we never get the sense he's actually good at school. Right. I agree. To the other and I think there's another layer to this. To get into Synagogue, you have to pass a very rigorous exam that includes all kinds of history and mathematics and science and you know you have to study quite a bit and you have to earn your place academically and the school of Synagogue is known for being highly academic and anyone that goes to that school is getting the best education in the whole empire so that right away is telling and then we know that the school in king killer chronicles it's like you take the exam, and if you do bad, you can still pay to get in. You know, it just affects your tuition. So anyone can go if they're rich enough, basically. And Ambrose, yeah. we know, comes from a noble family. And uh, although we don't know if how you know how potentially dumb or smart he is, I do feel like just the fact of going to Syndergaard versus the fact of of um, what's the name of the university in. King Killer, uh, but the university. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so Nailed just it. that, just that alone makes me want to lead towards Alton as well. Yeah, I think you're thinking all right, right along the lines I am there. So, all not, right, not a big debate to be had, like the Giselle versus Yoda confrontation we just went which through. i'm still not thrilled about <laughs> <laughs> yeah and yoda's probably not thrilled either but those are the results that's that's how the that's how the hammer fell on that one i think we're at the point of who would win uh where we do the time old tradition of having our returning champions come back f to defend the title for, for those of you that have not been listening, at the end of every Who Would Win, we do a three-legged race competition, which is um, two groups of two. Um, each group has one of their legs tied together, so it's three legs, two people, trying to run a race against the other team. It's a very roundabout way of explaining it, but you get the idea. Three-legged yeah. race. Nailed it. And we've had the defending champions for the past two matches. We have Ray from Star Wars and Ham yes. from the King uh, from Mistborn. <laughs> and these <laughs> two have beaten a lot of people. They beat Quoth. I mean, come on. They beat Quoth and Doxin. That was a big win. They, yep, that was a big win. That was a grudge match. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> The two people who get called Mary Sue most in this little I <laughs> know. Genre it was just the right fact here. that Doxin really kind of held Quoth back on that one. <laughs> that was a tough The lack of supernatural abilities or feats of strength really did that one dirty. But Yeah, I think even without it, it though, 
Uh, Ham's more athletic. So that was a tough one for Quoth to end up stuck with Dachshund in the middle of all that. But, yeah, we've got Ham returning alongside Ray from Star Wars. So who are they going to go up against this time, Charles? All right. Well, this time, uh, in an attempt to steal the title, we have... Another member of the army over in the Union in the King Killer Chronicles. Uh, the young upstart himself worked his way up from nothing. Now he's something. Uh, that can you only mean be. In first law. Oh, yeah. What did I say? <laughs> King Killer. <laughs> <laughs> you yes. Think everyone's in King Killer. <laughs> no. You got King Killer on the mind over there, Charles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like everyone's in King Killer right now. Okay. So this character's in the first. We love chronicle. the King Killer Chronicle we here at the Friends do. Talking Fantasy but Podcast. But you know what so else much. we love here? We love the uh, the First Law series. We and do. In the First Law series, there's one particular character who. Born a commoner and through nothing but hard work and determination, it rose up the ranks in a world that you know you you no one rises above their station. Hard to do that. Hard yeah. to do. Nearly impossible. But this person did it, and that person is none other than he Colum was first West. First through the breach at Olrian. First through the breach at Olrian. It's probably I mean, fast. On. Yeah, fast and brave. And then. On the other side, you have um, this is a nobleborn person, um, one of the elite houses over in the Mistborn trilogy, and there's no more noble house than House Venture, and within House Venture, you have the young, bookish, but you know, uh, seemingly. Not so bad, Ellen Venture. <laughs> Try not to do spoilers. Not so bad. <laughs> he's bookish. Well, he's got Vin's attention. Yeah, this is this is Ellen from the first Mistborn book. I would say. I think That's you have go to yeah. here. You mm-hmm. have to, and you know, you you want to say that. Column's doing some good work over there, like we said. First through the breach at Oriak. He's probably fast. We know he's athletic. He's tall, too, is something that's mentioned in the first Law mm-hmm. series. So big strides there, Charles. He competed in the fencing tournament. So right. there's that athletic. as well. Yeah. So I think that you got to give them a lot of credit for having column on the team but ellen charles <sighs> ellen i know i know ellen is tough because when we first meet ellen uh, i mean he's a noble born son and he reads lots of books and that's what we know <laughs> about ellen <laughs> and and that doesn't get you far in a three-legged race no, uh, it doesn't really matter how many books you've read. When it comes to the three-legged racetrack, Charles, you put all that aside. He, he'd probably be trying to read a book. <laughs> you know, he, <laughs> he'd probably he's like try to get to, out of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he probably would. I'm saying, like, literally, while he's running the race, he might be trying to read a book. Yeah, he he's the kind of guy who would like purposely like not throw the match but like purposely like be like this is i'm not paying attention to this this is not a big deal i'm just gonna read right now like he would have the book open and that (laughs) does not help when you're when you have people like ray and like ham who are determined who are here to win these are champions these are veterans of the three-legged race track you know you gotta come focused and hungry for that w yeah, and I think Column's hungry for the W. Very it's hungry. The first None is more determined than Column West. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's a shame. Again, it's a shame to see. <laughs> I think West the... would be like, "Could you just put that book down?" <laughs> 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 I would like to see that interaction between Column West and Ellen. It'd yeah. be fun. But uh, you hate him for again, being noble for not taking the contest seriously. I think they would yeah. butt heads. I think so too. And you and, don't want to butt heads in a three legged race with your partner. You don't want a probably relatively unathletic Ellen 
attached to you there when you're trying to run this race as column west i have a hard time thinking that it's a shame again like a more unathletic misborn character in the mix here is holding back someone who'd have a legitimate shot i think if they had a good part Yes, Calm West is a great partner to have, like a non-magic partner to have. It, it doesn't yeah. get much better than Calm West. And then if only you had um, another potentially strong or fast character here, like anyone from like Book of the Ancestor would have been great, except for maybe Avis Glass. <laughs> so, uh, even you, Charles, even if we actually drew whoa. you for once, you've got... I mean, I saw you out there on field day, and you <laughs> could run a three-legged race with the best of them. You've got long strides yourself. I think yeah. you and Column would have been a great team. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Dylan. I, I, if I find myself hard to believe the idea of me beating Ray in anything, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, and him also, uh, except if it was a contest of. of of wits maybe i could take ham but uh, ray would be tough whoa <laughs> but i think you could take ham in a contest of wits. well in like things like katan or talk or any of these other things i think i could take them wow well trivia i could take ham in trivia what does ham know <laughs> ham's got the philosopher's spirit he's got but he's not good at like easy he's not good at giving you a straightforward answer and i think charles you'd be able to oh yeah a like debates answer. uh elections yeah you know, but racing i don't know even without pewter he's still a formidable opponent and that's the issue right. we're having here i mean he's won twice already so uh yeah i think him and ray i think i'd just be keeping up with wes or doing my best to keep up with him you know yeah. If this was book one, Charles, maybe, but I'm at the book point in the series Charles. now where I don't know if I got it in me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it probably is book one, Charles, because no spoilers for Charles and <laughs> all that. So, Right, right. So I think you got to give it to our defending champions here, unfortunately. Yeah. I, and I say unfortunately because I really wanted to see you know, this team come together here of, of Wes and Ellen Venture, but you can't give it to them. I just think it's like, okay, we've seen a lot of Ray and Ham at this point. So Yes, I think the crowd is ready for a new champion, but the fact remains, you, you can't just be popular. You, you got to walk the walk as well. And that's what these champions have failed to do. So got to continue. Well, the champions have not failed to do the the right, challengers. Right, right. The challengers. Thank you. The challengers. Right. So, all right. Tough, well, tough that's break. A, that's tough, a tough sitch. Loss. Tough sitch. If only Ellen Venture applied himself a little bit, things might be different. But what can you do? You sound like his dad. <laughs> oh, God. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. I think we've done it. Have we set out to, to accomplish what. Uh, we definitely said. Well, have out. we done what we've set out to accomplish? I don't know if we did today? it. <laughs> that's well, up for you, the listener, to decide. That's true. Uh, but you know, in the meantime, this has been a fun little. Would you rather? You know. Nope. For- <laughs> 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 <This is> <laughs> you know, this has been a fun King Killer discussion, guys. <laughs> yeah. Another great King Killer Chronicle discussion on the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast. You know, I know where I am right now. <laughs> Charles. <sighs> you didn't even show up with an old fashioned to this one. Oh, God. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm recording out of my studio, so I'm a little out of my element here. Um, but for now... Uh, this is it, guys. I think I might as well just bring that outro music in before I say anything else. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking 
Fantasy Podcast. Uh, this has been Charles and uh, my co-host Dylan. If you like what you heard today and you want to throw us some support, go ahead and find us on Twitter, and that is at the FTF Podcast with a number one at the end. Uh, if you prefer Facebook or Instagram, we have those two, and that's at the FTF Podcast. If you want to send us an email, we know what. We also have one of those. And you can reach us there at uh, theftfpodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts over email. That's going to be really great. And then, uh, Dylan, if they want to show some support for the show and they just so happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, what can they do for us? Toss five stars to our podcast. Just find where those stars are by scrolling down on our little Friends Talking Fantasy podcast page on Apple Podcasts and click five of them if you've got the time. That's exactly right. You know, it's something that's free to do and, you know, kind of easy to do. You got to scroll down a little bit. You got to click that button. But you know what? It means so much to us. We greatly appreciate it, guys. But you know what? Getting to the end, listening to the episode, that's already more than enough. And we thank you yeah. for that, for all of your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends. <laughs>